If you thought about it, I mean, really thought about it, I bet you could remember a couple moments in your life that you cannot explain in any rational way. A last-minute change of plans that saved you from certain death. A bad feeling that kept you from being alone with a dangerous man. What do you do with those memories? Do you ignore them? Do you tuck them into a drawer in your mind and forget about them? Do you become obsessed with them, searching for meaning where no meaning exists? Or do you learn to live with the mystery? Do you find a way to accept the not knowing? I met a woman once who showed me a magical photograph. This was many years ago when I still worked as a reporter. I was working on the Amy Mihaljevic case, and the more I wrote about it, the more I started hearing from so-called psychics who wanted to tell me about the visions they were having of Amy's killer. Believe it or not, I consider myself a skeptic, especially when it comes to psychics. In a way, my life is a testament to the unreliability of soothsayers. You see, after I was born, but still very young, both my mother and father had encounters with psychics. I think my father ran into one at a party and my mother met one at a carnival or something. Anyway, both these psychics warned my parents that I would not survive childhood. I was supposed to get really sick and die young. So anytime I got a cold, my parents kind of freaked out. I turned 40 last year. In the words of Stephen Wright, I plan to live forever. So far, so good. Anyway, the psychic from Cleveland, she called me up at the office and told me she had a magic Polaroid photograph, and it had something to do with the Amy Mihaljevic case. I was about to dismiss her entirely when she explained to me that she had worked closely with Amy's mother, Margaret, before she died in 2001. Not only that, but Margaret had given her a family photo album full of pictures from Amy's childhood. She wanted me to return it to Amy's father after I came to see the picture. She lived in a little house on the west side. We sat in her kitchen and she explained the things she could do. She believed that she had the ability to influence photographs as they developed that she could help a spirit show itself. She told me that after Amy's body was found in the field off County Road 1181 in Ashland County, she'd driven down and had taken a picture of the dirt, and in the photo that developed was a man's face. You've probably heard of this phenomenon called periodolia, how the human brain is hardwired to search for faces in clouds and machines. If you try hard enough, you might see the face of Jesus in a piece of burned toast. I figured it was going to be something like that. And then she showed me the Polaroid. And in the dirt field, plain as day, I saw a man's face in the shadows. I don't mean maybe. It was a man's face. He was average looking, Caucasian, bald on top. Looking at that photo, my entire body went cold. My first thought was that it had been superimposed. That's what the FBI thought too, when she showed it to them. But they took the Polaroid apart and they found it had not been manipulated. There are more things in heaven and earth, Horatio, than are dreamt of in your philosophy of crime. I'm your host, James Renner. When they're on the record, detectives often tell reporters that psychics are con men, mischief makers, parasites. But off the record, every detective I know, they've all worked with psychics. Some of them even believe they have a psychic twinkle themselves. I met a retired FBI agent who worked on the Mihaljevic case at a greasy spoon in Illyria one morning, and he asked me with a straight face if I'd ever heard the voice of Amy's killer. What do you mean, I asked. Do you ever hear him in your head? No, I said. Well, I do. On the anniversary of Amy's abduction, October 27th, he visits the site and parks his truck down the road a bit and sits there in the dark and listens. After a while, he says, he can hear the killer's voice talking. He can never make out what the man is saying, though, as it seems distant and muffled, but he can hear him well enough that if he's ever caught, the agent is sure he'll recognize it. Go out there and listen, he said. And so I did. I didn't hear anything that night, not for sure. But I did have a very intense nightmare about the case not too long after that. I dreamt I was sitting down to breakfast with Amy and her family on the day she disappeared. I had to warn them about what was going to happen, but I couldn't push the air out of my lungs in order to make a sound. 
I just sat there while they cleared their bowls of half-eaten cereal, and Amy put on her jacket and grabbed her backpack and ran out the door. I woke myself up with a scream, and then I was sure I heard someone small running down the stairs outside my bedroom door. There are branches of philosophy that contemplate the unseen world, metaphysics, panpsychism, spiritualism. Spiritualism is the belief that there is an immaterial reality that cannot be perceived by our normal senses, a world that speaks to us in images of the future and of the past and of the faraway present, a world where our souls reside, where God and angels and demons may live. This is not the exclusive purview of quacks either. Famous spiritualist philosophers include Plato and Descartes. Smart men know that there are things we sense that we cannot explain by physics alone. Skeptical? Then tell me how, when you're at a stoplight looking forward, how is it that we can feel when the driver of the car next to us looks over at us? We can feel their gaze before we look back at them. I think every parent has a little psychic twinkle. My mother had eyes in the back of her head. Didn't yours? But can anyone prove that there is more to this world than meets the eye? A few brave philosophers have tried. The eyes see only what the mind is prepared to comprehend. That's a quote from a French philosopher named Henry Bergson, a man who believed intuition was a better tool than science for understanding reality. This guy was a big muckety-muck at the turn of the 20th century, a member of a prominent family in Paris. The best man at his wedding was the famous author, Marcel Proust, who wrote In Search of Lost Time. He surrounded himself with intellectuals and occultists. His brother-in-law was one Samuel Little McGregor Mathers, founder of the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn, an organization devoted to the study of paranormal activities. Yes, Bergson was connected to an early version of the X-Files, whose members practiced astrology and taught magical spells. Bergson was inspired by Socrates, who believed that the physical world is not real at all, but made up of shadows of perfect forms that, for example, in some other realm there exists a perfect chair, and the one you're sitting on right now is just a representation of this idea in our physical space. That somewhere there exists true justice, when all we can manage here is an imperfect version of it. Bergson believed that time was like this too. When Einstein became famous for his theories connecting time and space, Bergson got all bent out of shape. You can't measure time like that, he said. Time can't be divided into discrete, tiny little bits the way space can. He believed that time was outside the realm of mathematics and it can't be measured or observed except in hindsight. How do you measure the present when it's gone as soon as you look for it? Time is not a constant. Anyone who has spent time in detention knows that time is not constant. It inches forward slowly when we're in trouble. It moves faster when we're having fun. On paper, an hour is an hour, but in our hearts, we know differently. Intuition tells us differently. This is what Bergson called duration. That's duration with a capital D. Consider the life of a man. He lives to be 100 years old. Scientists could measure the events of his life from beginning to end on a large graph arranged by years and months and days and hours and seconds. But for that man, time did not flow at a constant speed. There were moments when he feared the dawn, lying awake at night with worry. There were times, the day he met his wife, the birth of his child, that zoomed by in a flash. That man knows how long he's lived. He can feel that duration. Science can say he lived 100 years, but what was the duration of that life? How long did it feel to be inside it? The human soul just can't be measured by math and neither can time. And this suggests there is much more going on here. The 17th century philosopher Gottfried Wilhelm Leibniz asked, why is there something rather than nothing? That is the question at the heart of metaphysics. What is all of this about? And Bergson believed we can sense the truth only through the use of intuition, not science. 
Intuition is defined as the ability to acquire knowledge without evidence or reasoning. And this is what psychics claim they can do better than anyone. Remember when we met Dr. Peter Venkman for the first time in Ghostbusters? He was running a scientific test on psychic ability on two subjects, a funny looking young man and a hot blonde. He holds up cards with shapes, triangles, wavy lines, and they have to guess what shape he's looking at. If they get it wrong, he gives them an electric shock. Of course, he rigs the game for the hot blonde, but if you watch the scene again, you'll notice he inadvertently proves that negative reinforcement, shocking that nerd, causes him to actually become psychic. This sort of testing is real. It's happened at prestigious universities. There are scientists who study psychic powers. One of them is a guy named Daryl Bem, a social psychologist and professor at Cornell. Bem believes science can prove the existence of psychic phenomena in a number of ways. The Gansfield experiment, for instance, is a way of testing telepathy, the ability to read a person's mind. For this experiment, there are two people, a receiver and a sender. The receiver sits in a room and wears a mask, usually made of ping pong balls cut in half and placed over their eyes. They wear headphones that broadcast white noise so they can't hear anything. In another room, which can be in another state or halfway around the world, the sender randomly chooses an object to think about. Then the receiver is asked to talk out loud and describe what they see in their mind. What Bem and his colleagues discovered was that some receivers managed to see what the sender was saying by way of telepathy more often than chance should allow. In 2011, Bem published the results of a new experiment in the Journal of Personality and Social Psychology. For this experiment, Bem hooked people up to a machine that measured physical arousal. The subject was placed in front of a computer that showed randomly selected images, which were either erotic or repulsive, think CSI crime scene stuff. What he found was that some people showed signs of arousal just prior to the erotic image appearing on screen. Their mind seemed to sense what was coming. No pun intended. Governments around the world believe enough in psychic phenomena to try to weaponize it. During the Cold War, we learned that the Soviet Union was spending a lot of money on psychics skilled at remote viewing the ability to travel outside their body and go any place in the world to spy on the enemy. So in 1978, the U.S. Army established the Stargate Project at Fort Meade. An Army lieutenant recruited psychics from across the country to spy on the Soviets using remote viewing capabilities. These people, one of which was a police officer from California, claimed that they could track down atomic weapons and even double agents by leaving their physical bodies and traveling through an astral plane of existence. The project was terminated in 1995. According to Congress, the Stargate project never proved that psychics were real, or so they'd have us believe. But back to crime. No matter what you believe personally, a handful of psychics have solved some of the coldest cases. December 15, 1980, 31-year-old Melanie Uribe left for her shift at Pacoima Hospital in Burbank, California, where she worked as a nurse, but she never arrived. Police found her pickup truck the next day and her nurse's uniform nearby. Etta Smith, a young woman who worked as a shipping clerk, heard about Uribe's disappearance on the radio. Suddenly, she had a vision. In her mind, she saw a canyon and a curving road and a dirt path. She felt she could find this place if she went searching. She contacted Detective Lee Ryan and showed him on a map where she thought Uribe's body could be found. It was in a remote section of the San Fernando Valley. But rather than waiting for the police to take her seriously, she drove there with her daughter. It was her daughter who spotted something white in the bushes. A closer look revealed the body of Melanie Uribe and her white nurse's shoes. Police were suspicious of Etta Smith, the only way she could have known about the location of Uribe's body, they thought, was if she had been involved. They arrested Smith and charged her with the murder. Luckily, a short time later, a man confessed to the killing, saying that he and two other men had carjacked Uribe when she stopped at an intersection. They took her into the country before robbing and raping her. 
Etta Smith was released and the three men were convicted. Afterward, Smith sued the police and was awarded $26,000 for her wrongful arrest and suffering. One of the most heinous crimes ever committed was the brutal slaying of the List family. John List was a Sunday school teacher and accountant living with his family in Westfield, New Jersey. A real nerd of a guy, pocket protector and all. Not the type you'd expect could be violent. And yet, on November 9th, 1971, he murdered his mother, his wife, and his three children in his home and left a note confessing to it all before promptly disappearing. For many years, List was a fugitive and police had nothing in the way of solid leads, so Detective Jeffrey Hummel sought out a psychic by the name of Elizabeth Lerner. She told police that List was alive, but had traveled to another state by bus, that there was a new woman in his life, and they should look into connections to Baltimore and Virginia. After America's Most Wanted profiled the case a short time later, a witness called in to say he knew where the police could find the man. He was his neighbor. Turns out List had fled on a bus and met a woman in Baltimore who he married. He was arrested in Virginia. I came across another fascinating case on the Mysteries of Canada website I'd like to share with you. 90 years ago, in the small town of Beachy, Saskatchewan, a mentalist who was known as Professor Henry Gladstone came to town to show off his skills on stage at the little theater they have in town. He performed for several minutes, guessing what people in the crowd were thinking, when he suddenly pointed at a local rancher named Bill Taylor. You there, he said, the man you're thinking about. He was a good friend of yours, wasn't he? The rancher nodded. I'm sorry to tell you this, said Gladstone, but he was murdered. Then the professor pointed to another man, Constable Charles Carey. That's him, said Gladstone. That's the man. That's the one who will find the body of the murdered man. The guy Gladstone was talking about was old Scotty McLaughlin, a friend of Taylor's who'd vanished after selling his ranch a couple years before. Gladstone was sure that he could identify the man who killed McLaughlin if he could accompany the Mounties as they questioned suspects. Reluctantly, the detectives agreed that he could come along. Gladstone accompanied two Mounties on a visit to John Schumacher, McLaughlin's former business partner. During the interview, Gladstone was struck with a vision, like that character from The Dead Zone that Christopher Walken played. There was a fight, said Gladstone. Scotty fell and you struck him, and you struck and struck, and then you buried his body near the barn. But Schumacher said he didn't know what the old wizard was getting on about. The next day, the Mounties dug up the barn on Schumacher's property and found what remained of Scotty McLaughlin buried under the manure pile. He got seven years in prison. These stories make for great headlines, but the truth is, for every psychic tip that solves a case, there are thousands that lead nowhere, or worse. Sylvia Brown can suck it. One of the most famous psychics of the 20th century, Sylvia Brown was a frequent guest of Larry King and Montel Williams. She became quite famous because of her TV appearances and was able to charge $750 for personal 20-minute readings over the phone. By the time she croaked, Ms. Brown was making around $3 million a year. What a lot of people don't know was that Brown was also a convicted fraudster. Back in the 80s, she and her husband had sold securities for a phony gold mining venture. They swindled one couple out of $20,000, which should have been used to operate a gold mine, but actually went into their other business, the Nirvana Foundation for Psychic Research. Brown was indicted on grand larceny charges and ultimately pleaded no contest. She was sentenced to probation and 200 hours of community service. Anyway, if you don't know about this douche canoe, to borrow a colorful insult, here's what she did. She went on these TV programs and gave readings to families whose loved ones were missing. Except she often only added to their heartache. In 2002, she told the parents of Sean Hornbeck that he'd been taken by a Hispanic man and murdered. He was found alive in 2007, and his kidnapper was a white guy. But the absolute worst was when she appeared on Montel and spoke to the mother of Amanda Barry. She told Amanda's mother that her daughter was dead. She's not alive, honey, she said. Amanda's mom died two years later, 
she died without ever knowing that Amanda had been abducted by Ariel Castro and would make it out of that ordeal not just alive, but with a daughter of her own. I was a reporter in Cleveland back then. I wrote about Amanda. I searched for her. I met the families. I've seen the damage that can be done by people who claim to be psychics. Brown was not the worst, but she was the most famous of the bunch. Prognosticators who consult with police prefer to call themselves psychic detectives, as if they graduated some weird training academy. The Committee for the Scientific Investigation of Claims of the Paranormal, or NAMBLA, has a task force devoted to systematically explaining how every case in which a psychic detective helped the police catch a killer are instances of exaggeration or histrionics. In 2008, the managing editor of the magazine Skeptical Inquirer challenged the host of the Skeptico podcast to present the very best case to support the idea that a psychic had actually solved a crime. The host chose the story of psychic Nancy Weber and a New Jersey serial killer. Weber is one of the most famous psychic detectives, and if you go to her website, you can still book your tickets to her psychic cruise later this year. She helped detectives in Parsippany, New Jersey, who were tasked with finding the person who murdered high school cheerleader Amy Hoffman. She worked directly with detectives Jim Moore and Bill Hughes. They took her to the mall parking lot where Amy was abducted, and Nancy said she felt the traumatic energy of the abduction there. She told them she saw a green car. She described the abduction as if she were witnessing it happen and mentioned details only the police knew. Next, they took her to the site where the girl's body had been found. She said she could hear Amy's screams and that she could see the guy who stabbed her. She began to describe him to the detectives. Then, a second girl was murdered. The body of Deidre O'Brien was found at a rest stop on Route 80, and a witness said he'd seen a green sedan leaving the area. Nancy got sick. She felt that there was about to be another victim, and it took a toll on her. She could see this man stalking a new girl, and she knew his name was James, but she couldn't see his last name. The detectives showed up at her house the next day and told her they'd caught the guy. His name was James, James Kodadich, and he drove a green sedan. Sounds amazing, right? Proof of the supernatural, evidence for the power of psychic detectives. But when the host of Skeptico looked into it 26 years later, he found that the detective's original notes contradicted the wonderful story told by Nancy Weber, and that if she'd really given them so much information, all they'd had to do was look at the local phone book to figure out who their killer was. The likely explanation is that those involved are being influenced by confirmation bias. They want to believe Weber helped them because it's a better story. As a true crime reporter, I get messages every day from people who have had visions about some unsolved crime. 99% of the time it goes something like this. I see a red barn and a gravel road. I sense a name. It starts with a B. Bless their hearts. They mean well. And they took the time to track down my email and write me a letter, but there's absolutely nothing I can do with that information. And let's say I did use it and, and it checked out. As a middle-aged, clean-cut, kind of chubby white man, if I found a body and explained to the police that I was led there by a psychic, I'm quite likely to end up behind bars. If not because it makes me a suspect, then because I've contaminated a goddamn crime scene. Still, I want to believe. When I was deep into my research of Maura Murray's disappearance, I took a trip to Ocean City with my family. We make the seven hour drive every two years and we stay in Fenwick or Bethany Bay and go down to the boardwalk at night. If you've never been there, the Ocean City boardwalk is a wonderful holdover from the 50s. It's two and a half miles of taffy shops and arcades and french fry stands. On one end, they have this old haunted house ride in a little amusement park with these steel coasters older than my grandfather. At night, the buskers come out, the street performers with open jars full of dollar bills at their feet. 
Not far from the haunted house, an alley snakes away from the boardwalk. I was holding my wife's hand and enjoying a late walk, and I looked that way in the dark and I saw her sign, Psychic Jean. And for some reason I was drawn by the romantic idea that I should visit her and ask her about Mora. There was something about that night I'm not explaining well, a, a sense of freedom, of possibility, that all my troubles were petty and had been left far behind in Ohio and that none of it really mattered. Jean invited us in. She was a carefully ancient woman, bent over a bit. She brought us into her apartment and motioned for Julie to sit on the couch by the TV, which was playing that scene from Misery where poor Sheldon gets hobbled. I'd like you to tell me what you can about a young woman who went missing a few years ago, I said. Jean sighed. You want me to find this girl? Tell you where she is? Yes. She nodded. Okay, let's do this. She walked over to a nook behind a cotton partition, motioned for me to follow. But I can only tell you what I see. Julie started after us, but Jean put up a hand. No, dear, you must not enter. I went in alone. I sat across from the woman at a round table. She produced a stack of well-worn tarot cards. Cut the deck three times, she said. I obliged. Put $25 on top. Sure, there's a bottom line, always, but hey, I knew psychics enough to know this was cheap, weirdly cheap. I gave her the money and the cards, and she made the green disappear. She began to place the cards in a pattern upon the tablecloth, the hermit upside down, the sun, a guy being stabbed by swords, and on the very top of everything, the fool. She looked over the cards at me, and I was struck by the beauty of her eyes. Such an old face, full of hardship, but those eyes? Were they violet even? I heard once that only Elizabeth Taylor had violet eyes. There's a lot of darkness here, she said. You have traveled. You have much traveling to do still. And what about Mora? I asked. I hadn't come here to hear about me. She was not traveling alone, said Jean with confidence. I had told her nothing of Mora's case or even her name, nothing more than she was a young woman who had gone missing. Her car was left behind, and then she left with this other person. She wanted to be lost. You will not find her. She does not want to be found. Her life was sadness, bad luck. She wanted to escape this. Where did she go? I cannot see her. She's either dead or the darkness is hiding her. Jean's eyes opened. They stared back at me, accusatory. You went into her past? Yes. As far as her school years, didn't you? Yes. Why? It's so much sadness. I shrugged. You thought this would be an adventure, but her bad luck has rubbed off on you, hasn't it? I didn't say anything. I heard Julie stir on the couch in the other room. Why did you welcome this darkness? I need to ask you, do you ever feel possessed? By work, I said. Jean nodded. Yes, you must leave this. Go, as quickly as you can. Leave it behind before the darkness follows you home. She waved her arms over the cards as if to wash them off, and I took this as a sign to leave. I stood up and took Julie's hand and thanked Jean for her time. The woman put a cold hand on my arm, staying me a moment. This young woman you're trying to find, she was her own. Then she shook her head and went silent. What? I don't want to say. She was her own what? She was her own disaster. The Philosophy of Crime is a Fearful Symmetry production. This episode was recorded by Jeff Koval at the State Level Recording Studio in Fairlawn, Ohio. It was produced and edited by William Mankey. I'm James Renner. If you enjoyed this podcast, please visit jamesrenner.com, where you can find links to the other stuff I do, including virtual reality journalism. I also currently host Lake Erie's Coldest Cases for Discovery ID, you can find every episode on idgo.com. My latest novel, Muse, will be published in May. You can order Muse and my other books online or anywhere books are sold. William Mankey also writes the music for this podcast. Check out his other creation, Genius Dice, wooden dice that will give an artful twist to your gaming night, available to order on Amazon or also woodif.com. Until next time, remember, there's a simple but challenging solution to the epidemic of crime. 
If everyone took the time to make good friends with their neighbors, we would know when someone needs our help before they become a statistic. Don't be fearful of the world. Make friends and make it better. Psychic detectives. Psychic detectives. Psychic detectives. This man's face. Psychic detectives. His name was James. Psychic detectives. A funny looking man. Psychic detectives. It was a man's face. Psychic detectives. A funny looking young man. Psychic detectives. His name was James. His name. His name. His name. His name was James. The fool. 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 Psychic detectives. Psychic detectives. Psychic detectives. His name was His name was James. The psychic detectives. His name was James. A funny looking young man. A funny looking young man. A funny looking young man. His name was James. Was James. Was James. Was James. The fool.